Hey guys, and welcome to the Working Money Channel. I got XRP up here on the daily right now, XRP trading at just about 40 cents. It's just been hovering around this area, 0 0.399, 0 0.400. So right now it is at 40 cents on the dot. Not really too much to talk about with regards to the price. I mean, uh, Bitcoin and XRP relatively moving at the same rate. The market hasn't seen too much action, at least not within the last 24 hours. Just wanted to touch a little bit on uh, some updates that James K. Filan has given us here with regards to the Ripple SEC lawsuit. I have some thoughts on timing regarding the Hinman documents, the summary judgment motions, and the outstanding ceiling issues. Rather than typing out a long thread, I have written them like a normal human being in a document here. So James K. Filan, uh, you know, rejecting the whole Twitter format and decided to just write it out for us. So I'm going to read you guys a little bit of what James K. Filan thinks, uh, with regards to the next steps in the Ripple SEC lawsuit, I have some thoughts on the Hinman documents and the outstanding ceiling issues. I don't think we are going to see references to the Hinman documents in the upcoming replies. So he doesn't think we're going to see them. To the extent the Hinman documents are referenced, I think the SEC will redact those references as they have in the past. I also don't think that Judge Torres will rule on the ceiling issues soon after uh, January 9th because it probably isn't how Judge Torres is going to approach the remainder of the case. So, so listen closely. He is taking cues from Judge Torres here as to how he sees uh, the rest of this information unfolding or being revealed. There are three big issues outstanding. Summary judgment motions, uh, expert challenges, and ceiling issues regarding the expert reports. The Hinman documents and the other material relied on by the SEC and Ripple in their motions. What Judge Torres relies on in making her decision on the summary judgment motions will likely dictate what she will unseal. If the judge relies on a document in her decision, that document is considered a judicial document and then it will be disclosed. So what does that mean? I think Judge Torres will work backwards. First, she will draft her summary judgment ruling and identify any one of those now sealed or redacted documents that she relied on. If she relied on them, they would be discussed in her ruling and she would unseal them. If she doesn't rely on a document in her decision, then the question of whether the document needs to remain sealed becomes moot. So know what he's saying here. Essentially, she will only discuss the documents that she sees relevant in making her decisions. He goes on to say the same with expert motions. If she doesn't rely on expert, uh, or sorry, rely on an expert in her summary judgment decisions, there would be no need for her to address the motion to strike that expert's testimony. So uh, it sounds as though, at least as according to James K. Filan, that she's going to try to be as efficient as possible and only address those points that she uh, that she plans on using in the future. My point is, why would Judge Torres slog through the expert motions and the sealing motions, including the sealing of the Hinman documents separately, before deciding what parts of them, if any, are relevant to deciding the summary judgment motion? I don't think she will. It goes on to say this is exactly what she did in the case involving Goldman Sachs that had ceiling disputes, challenges to the experts, and motion for summary judgment when she decided those issues. Uh, she did it at the same time in one ruling, and in a footnote in that ruling, she basically said, if it's uh, discussed here in my opinion, it's a judicial document, I relied on it, and it will be made public. So taking some cues from the Goldman Sachs case that she tried. Uh, so I don't think we should expect a separate ruling on the ceiling of the expert materials, the Hinman document or other materials relied on by the parties. I believe she will decide everything together and it won't be until she rules on the motions for summary judgment and it will be in one big written ruling. So, one of the pros here in the XRP community giving his two cents on uh, what we're going to see likely from Judge Torres, uh, how it's going to go down. I know there has been a lot of speculation as to uh, how this is going to unfold, uh, and people in the XRP community just thanking James K. Filan for this. Bill Morgan responding also, very cogent, James. It changes my settlement analysis timing, but the SEC cannot be sure she will not rely on the Hinman documents or on what date she will deliver the judgments. So if they want to settle to avoid public unsealing of the documents, the SEC still will be under pressure to settle from January 9th, and the urgency will increase each week as an uncertain judgment date comes closer. So Bill's still saying that, uh, you know, the settlement pressure will be on, and uh, for us to be eyeing that January January 9th date. Uh, so just thought I'd give you guys those uh, those details, that update on the Ripple SEC lawsuit as per some lawyers in the XRP community. But guys, this is what's gotten everybody in the crypto space on crypto Twitter, uh, in the cryptocurrency industry talking. Sam Bankman Fried recently did an interview with Andrew Sorkin. And uh, there's a lot of debate as to how this went, a lot of opinions. 
I'm just going to touch on some of the highlighted parts here. Uh, Crypto Eddie posted this. Okay, so some of the questions asked, and uh, you know, some of these things are just unbelievable. The way he responds to these uh, questions. What are Sam's lawyers telling him right now? Uh, she goes on to ask, does Sam think he could go to the United States? Also, how concerned is Sam about criminal liability? Listen to this. What are your lawyers telling you right now? Are they suggesting this is a good idea for you to be speaking? Uh, no, they're very much not. Um, uh, and uh, I mean, you know, the classic advice, right? Don't say anything, uh, you know, recede into a hole. Uh, and it's not who I am. I mean, it's not who I want to be. I don't have, I, I think I have a duty to talk to people. I have a duty to explain what happened. And I think I have a duty to do everything I can to try and do what's right. If there is anything I can do to, to try and help customers out here. And uh, I don't see what good is accomplished by me just sitting locked, uh, you know, it, it, you know, in a room pretending the outside world doesn't exist. Do you think you could come to the United States or go elsewhere? I, 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 I to my knowledge, I could. How concerned are you about criminal liability at this point? So I don't think that, I mean, obviously, I don't, I don't personally think that I have, uh, you know, but I, I think the real answer is that's not, sounds weird to say, but, but. First of all, I don't know if you caught that. He didn't really even answer that question, but I'll let him continue. But I think the real answer is that's not what I'm focusing on. Okay, so criminal liability, not what he's focusing on, clearly. <laughs> Digital Nomad investor down here saying for sure Sam's lawyers have screamed from the rooftops for Sam Bankman fried not to do any interviews. Not one word that comes out of his mouth can help him. There is 100% risk and zero benefit from doing this from a legal standpoint. And this is why, guys, we are all assuming that this is all a charade, that this is all a show, because why would he come out? I mean, you know, this is the biggest story right now, certainly in crypto and arguably in finance, or at least one of the biggest stories. Why would he come out right after this happened and do an interview against his lawyer's wishes, if not for the optics and optics only? So people are questioning this. Uh, Jeremy Hogan also posting this. SPF is getting a light cross-examination at the NYT Dealbrook Summit and has made at least three incriminating statements so far. Why are his lawyers or parents letting him do this? That there is a much more closely connected um, version of FTX International and Alameda than previously understood. Fair to say? I yeah, I mean, given the size of the position, I think it, it was, uh, if not in intention, it was in effect uh, tied together substantially more than I would have ever wanted it to be. More tied together than I had wanted it to be. That is just one of the statements that he makes here. Also, I think I can hear uh, one of Jeremy's kids playing piano in the background. Sounds pretty good. Uh, continuing on here, watch your guru, Justin Sam Bankman fried says FTX US is fully solvent and withdrawals could be opened up today. Just to, to make a distinction here, you look at the US platform, you look at the international platform. The US platform uh, is a US regulated platform with American users. To my knowledge, that's fully solvent, that's fully funded. And uh, you know, I believe that withdrawals could be opened up today and everyone could be made whole from that, that none of these problems plagued the, the US platform. Okay. so. I mean, on the one hand, you got him saying, I, I didn't realize how interconnected the uh, the Alameda tie was uh, to the corporation. And then you have him, you know, standing firm on the fact that, well, I, I definitely know that the FTX US platform is fully solvent and we can make customers whole. We can open up withdrawals again. If these two companies are so interconnected and uh, not just the two companies, obviously, uh, all the companies under the umbrella of FTX, how is it then on the one hand, he 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 didn't know that you know certain a couple of these companies were so interconnected. But on the other hand, he does know that one of these companies could in fact uh, or is in fact fully solvent and could open up withdrawals and could make all their customers whole. Again, some of these things just aren't adding up, and people are noticing it. Kaleo here also posting this clip. There's going to be a time and a place for me to sort of think about myself and my own future, but I don't think this is it. Like right now, I mean, look, I, I've had a bad month. Um, this has not been any fun month for me, but that's not what matters here. Like what matters here is the millions of customers. What matters here is all the stakeholders in FTX uh, who, who got hurt and 
and trying to do everything I can to help them out. So we've got him making this statement, and then we've got the crowd laughing. Now, this is obviously an interview that was pre-planned. Why would they even have a crowd there? Um, and, you know, the fact that this is such a big deal, the fact that so many people lost money, how is it that it is appropriate whatsoever for these people to be laughing at this moment in time? Again, a hint to probably why this interview was set up, to convey certain optics to the people that, hey, look, this Sam Bankman Freed guy was just in the wrong place at the wrong time. He really is a good guy. Uh, and this is why we need to regulate crypto. We need to regulate the crap out of it because we can't have these kinds of things continuing to happen. And not pointing the finger at him, not putting the onus on him, making him responsible for what he did. Uh, a very subtle way of manipulation, but manipulation nonetheless, and people in the crypto community are not buying it. Uh, Eleanor Turret here saying in this interview with a uh, Andrew Sorkin, SBF, just described his meetings with Gary Gensler as the result of elbow grease that took him thousands of hours in Washington to achieve, would seem to contradict the chairman's come in and talk mantra. So then there's that point to it. I don't have a clip of that, but um, it, it, it did come out that uh, Sam Bankman-Fried uh, did need to co basically coerce the SEC to see uh, him and representatives of FTX in Washington. And uh, as he puts it, it took thousands of hours in Washington to, uh, to, to probably achieve what he came to achieve. And then this to finish it off, guys, Duo9 posted this. Imagine receiving a round of applause for creating a $10 billion Ponzi scheme. The world has lost touch with reality. On behalf of everybody here and on behalf of the public, I want to thank you for engaging in it at a time in truth when I know you've been advised not to. So thank you so very, very much. Um, thank you. Sam Bankman Freed, everybody. Can you believe this? And look, look at this woman here, for example, this one right here. She's just so like, yeah, look, you're doing such a great job. Oh my goodness, your, your, your courage. Good for you for standing up and doing this interview. It gets better, says Duo9. Call me crazy, but I think SBF is telling... The truth seems the bankruptcy review committee disagrees. <laughs> Never in my career have I seen such a complete failure of corporate controls and such a complete absence of trustworthy financial information as occurred here. From compromised systems integrity and faulty regulatory oversight abroad to the concentration of control in the hands of a very small group of inexperienced, unsophisticated, and potentially compromised individuals, this situation is unprecedented. So it certainly is heating up. Um, people in control wanting to protect Sam Bankman-Fried, at least this is how it appears to be. But we've got these bodies, on the other hand, like the Bankruptcy Review Committee, uh, essentially saying this is the this is the biggest, most corrupt situation of compromised individuals that they have seen. The situation is unprecedented. Uh, and guys, ProCoin News uh, posted this. This is basically the full interview and transcript of the Sam Bankman-Fried interview. So I will link this uh, link in the description if you guys want to watch the full thing or uh, read the full thing here, as uh, the transcript is also listed down here uh, in this article. And so Kevin O'Leary retweeting out Bill Ackman's tweet, I lost millions as an investor with FTX and got sandblasted as a paid spokesperson for the firm. But after listening to that interview, I'm in the Bill Ackman camp about the kid. So, you know, it gets me wondering why Joel Katz responding with this uh, great Seinfeld gif. It gets me wondering why. You know, it seems like the world is topsy-turvy, which, you know, when, when alarm bells go off and uh, you have a bad feeling in your gut about something, chances are something is awry, something smells foul. I just can't put my finger on it. Continuing to discuss this issue, Michael Branch posted this. So Will Clement came out and uh, gave his criticism along with uh, many other people in the crypto space. Uh, on November 30th, Sam Bankman-Fried sat down, did the interview. I didn't ever try to commit fraud on anyone. So uh, just down here, it's just summing up some of the answers he gave. Uh, the SBF legal strategy is to attempt to characterize fraud as incompetence in order to stay out of jail. This coming from uh, Gift and Civic co-founder Vinnie Lingham on Twitter. Other reactions were equally as vociferous as Carl Menger's tweet, SBF should be sitting in jail right now, but instead he is giving an interview to the New York Times Deal Book Summit. WTF is happening. Crypto Law also coming out after he made multiple self-incriminating statements. Andrew Sorkin asks SBF, what do your lawyers think of you giving this interview? As we saw in that uh, earlier clip, the audience bursts out laughing. Bankman Fried seems to be the only person in this broadcast who won't acknowledge he broke the law. Uh, crypto and blockchain lawyer Jake Chervinsky is also coming out, advised former Alameda executives to contact the Department of Justice. I wasn't running Alameda. I didn't know exactly what was going on. I didn't know the size of their position. 
if you're Caroline Capital or Alameda uh, Buco, I guess, uh, well, that's Carolyn Ellis and uh, another executive over there at Alameda. Right now, I assume you're watching this and thinking very hard about your options. The DOJ is only a phone call away. So um, a lot of criticism here, obviously, within the crypto space, because we have dedicated time, we have dedicated effort, and a lot of these companies dedicated a lot of money to building companies, to creating an ecosystem within cryptocurrency, and it seems as though it is crashing before our eyes. John Deaton also made the rounds on Fox Business. Some great clips here of John Deaton's reactions to this from Fox Business News. Listen to this. Crypto law founder John Deaton. And John... Uh, Sam Bankman-Fried, uh, he continues to suck all the oxygen out of the room. He keeps casting this dark shadow over the entire crypto world. So my, my question is, is why isn't he doing the perp walk yet? <laughs> you know, it's, I mean, really, it's like, it's just, you think of all these sort of things and, you know, I, I mean, I just don't recall Bernie Madoff, you know, making arounds like this. And again, from a journalistic point of view, you probably want to interview these folks, but other people are wondering, it's really, Billions are missing. Why is this guy walking around? You brought up Bernie Madoff. He was arrested the day after, you know, he confessed. Right. Sam Bate Friedman has confessed in his Twitter feed and everything else. Charles, I don't know, but there's two things you can do it. What I would do is you arrest now. There's enough information under 18 U.S.C. 1343. That's the wire fraud statute. There's enough for the fraud statute. He went around looking like crypto savior, pretending to be crypto savior, and he goes to BlockFi and says, I'll give you this loan, but you have to deposit your client money in my FTX account. And then, he, of course, he steals that money to run his Ponzi hedge fund. So if I were in charge, I'd have had him arrested, introduce him to a three by five cell, remind him of what Russ Albrecht, who did much less with Silk Road, is serving two life sentences plus 40 years. I'm hearing more and more about that. People are really uh, like, uh, you know, it's, it's a story we all kind of forgot about. And I want to bring you back and, and talk more specifically about that. But there's just so many headlines. This interview with Sam Bankman Fried, if you had a chance to ask him any questions right now, what do you want to hear? What do you what hasn't he blurted out yet that we need to know? Great question. The first thing I get him to agree that the user agreement specified that the funds were client only funds. And so he then commandeered those funds illegally and then sent them to Almeida. That needs to be up be brought up. Second, he had a back door. That back door allowed him to conceal the, the transfers from FTX to Alameda. But he claims, Charles, yeah. that he doesn't know how to code. Yeah. Yeah. So who did it? Who did it? He needs to know ask what those though, I, I'm, I'm So a lot of good points that John Deaton brings up. I was particularly interested in when he brought up uh, Ross Albright, uh, the guy who did run the Silk Road about a decade ago. Uh, and he's in jail essentially just for facilitating a website. And he had nothing to do with any of the transactions, but a lot of the uh, the transactions were made in Bitcoin. And uh, a lot of the people who were posting on that website were uh, for products that were uh, like drugs or weapons or, or something of the sort. So two very different examples here, but uh, Ross Albright's sentence, very harsh. Meanwhile, Sam Bankman fried still walks free. Uh, the second clip to this, just another 25 second clip of John Deaton on Fox Business. That's absolutely amazing. And, and as far as Janet Yellen, she says that this is not, that this is a Lehman-like situation for crypto. Charles, the only reason or way that it'll be like Lehman if no one goes to jail. That's the only way. This is not a Lehman moment in crypto. This is a Bernie Madoff moment in crypto. This is a Theranos moment in crypto. That's what this is. So basically what John Deaton's saying here, Janet Yellen is trying to gloss over this in, uh, in, a, in certain respects, trying to uh, liken it to the Lehman Brothers collapse. Whereas, no, we've got to categorize this correctly. This was fraud. This was more like Bernie Madoff. Uh, this is more like Theranos. If you guys don't know what either of those are about, I, uh, I suggest you do some research on Google. But more like fraud rather than what happened to the banks in 2008. Uh, and, and John Dean brings up a great point here. The only way it is like Lehman Brothers is if Sam Bankman fried doesn't go to jail. So what he's referring to is this Janet Yellen comment here. Listen to what she said about FTX, a Lehman Brothers moment. I have strongly believed and continue to believe, and I think everything we have lived through over the last couple of weeks, but earlier as well, says this is an industry that really needs to have adequate right. regulation, and it doesn't. We have consistently urged right. that regulatory gaps be closed, and I think this experience with his, his firm or set of firms just couldn't provide a better illustration. Um, the, you know, these are very risky assets. 
The, the good piece of an explosion like we saw is that it hasn't spilled over to the banking sector. Banking regulators have been very careful you don't think that about the, crypto. This is, there's no Lehman moment here for you. It's a Lehman moment within crypto, and crypto is big enough that you've had substantial harm of investors, right. and particularly people who aren't very well informed right. about the risk that they're undertaking. And that, that's, right. that's a very bad thing. So playing the part, trying to smooth the narrative, uh, making it sound like it is something that, well, you know, these kinds of things happen. Slap on the wrist for Sam Bankman Freed. Hopefully justice is served, but who knows if it will be, unfortunately. Digital Asset Buy here posting this. Everything is coming full circle now. This is the Mt. Gox guy, Patsy, he asks, who bought it from Jed McCaleb. Jed was never touched. Does this sound familiar? So if you guys are not familiar with the Mt. Gox uh, scandal, Jed McCaleb sold it to this guy, Mark Carpels here. Wow, SBF, if anything, I'm impressed on how you're ignoring any kind of legal advice and common sense by doing this kind of stuff. Very honestly, I haven't seen interviews for people in your situation help in any way, except to make things worse. Yet, he is being interviewed again on Good Morning America. Intuitive guy down here saying he bribed politicians, he bribed regulators, he bribed mainstream media. A new narrative where he is not the bad guy will be created, and it is being created in front of our eyes. Uh, it is just a big show created to fool the audience even more and let them ask for more regulations. And uh, here is just... Um, Another flashy, slick trailer for another interview that Sam Bankman Freed is going to be doing today, uh, I guess later this morning. I'm not going to play it for you guys, but just the tone of this uh, edited clip doesn't really convey a message of Sam Bankman Freed's guilt. I mean, I don't know, I could be wrong. You guys should watch it for yourself. So I think the message is clear. A lot of people in the crypto space seeing this as crime, essentially criminal activity, getting a slap on the wrist. Meanwhile, Congress, government, are they going to give Sam Bankman Freed a free pass, similar to what we saw in 2008 with the banking collapse? I don't know. Tell me down in the comments what you guys think, and please subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Like the video if you like the content I'm providing. I always love hearing your comments. See you in the next one, guys.